Okay. <laughs> you guys seem to like it when I do the long in-depth videos. And this is going to be a long in-depth video. <laughs> and yes, it's been quite some time since you've seen this side of the room. And there's a reason for that, which is that things have been changing. Now, this particular story begins 10 years ago, when I was very fortunate and I was able to bring home a Hewlett Packard Gen 5 uh, rack mount server to give you guys uh, a bit of a look at the differences between a PC and a server. <coughs> Unfortunately, I was still relatively new in my YouTube career and I didn't make a very good job of it. <laughs> But fortunately, thanks to what's in this box, <coughs> I get to revisit that mistake all over again. <laughs> yeah. So, the Gen 5 server was a serious piece of kit. It had facilities which um, really mark the difference between um, a PC which is doing the work of a server and a PC, well, a server, server, if you know what I mean. <coughs> and I didn't really go into the details as I should have done, could have done, whatever. That's what I'm hoping to write here and that's why this is going to be a bit of a long video. Because the G5, um, for all that it was, is whatever, wherever it happens to still be now living its life, <laughs> There was no way that I could realistically have it at home and many of you guys would probably be in the same position. You need um, a rack for a start <laughs> in order to house it properly and do the job right. Uh, it can be a bit hungry on power and as you guys know for some time I've been pretty big on low power computing. Um, <coughs> it generates a fair chunk of noise which is necessary to shift the heat that it generates. Um, but perhaps uh, most of all, if a part goes wrong, which typically with the server, which has already done a good chunk of service for someone, it's more likely to go wrong. <laughs> it's also gonna cost you a small fortune to, um, to get the necessary parts, you know, hard drives are typically uh, SAS as opposed to SATA and things like that. And yeah, <coughs> things get a bit difficult. So um, for some time, micro servers have been um, the, the server of choice, for want of a better word, <laughs> for, for the Soho. Small office, home office, Soho. And, um, yeah. You'll probably be more familiar with this kind of thing, which is a PC which is doing the job of a server. Uh, this is a game server. Um, <coughs> bog standard PC components. Um, unfortunately, because it is, a standard PC, it hasn't got any of the extra things that you will find in a server. Some of those things um, you can add, um, like for example, error correcting memory, this hasn't got it. Um, doesn't matter, it's a game server, uh, it's not too critical. But um, <coughs> yeah, it's it does a job, but it's it's a way off the, it's not a proper server. And this video is about showing you that difference. And I'm just going to put something here, <coughs> now that you've seen it, to block off the light. <laughs> now, uh, proper servers have got quite a few differences to them. And you will notice this over my right shoulder. Now this <coughs> is a microserver. And microservers have got their own history. I think Dell came out with the first microserver possibly in 2008-2009 and other manufacturers jumped on the bandwagon, um, Hewlett-Packard being one of them, obviously. But I think 
<coughs> Hewlett Packard's first micro server wasn't really a micro server in this form. I think it was more of a blade and the, a blade is a typically a chassis of some description with a lot of smaller servers um, in there. It was quite it was a few years later before this um, I think this was their first micro server in this form factor the generation 7 or gen 7 for short <laughs> it was sold very cheaply this one's been running now for about nine years and I bought it for about 170 pounds and that's a decent server that's a lot of server for your money error correcting memory for a start the hardware for the um, SATA controllers is hot swappable if you open one up you'll typically see that it says non hot swappable on the caddies and that's because they nobbled the hot swappable side in the BIOS <laughs> thanks HP well you know why they did that I don't know I mean they were offering a lot of server for not a lot of money and I think um, the Gen 7s really boosted the popularity for people like me um, you'll also note that there's a, a bay up here for CDs which I, I've replaced with a temperature monitoring and fan monitoring system so there's a fifth SATA cable behind there and at the back there is also an eSATA port for external um, external storage but I believe that they also nobbled those as well um, in terms of the speed the transmission speed on those ports they, they nobbled those I think they cut them down a bit but um, but nevertheless with those features cut out it was still a lot of server for your money and like I said this has now done nine years of service that's not bad that's what I'm hoping to get out of the replacement that also puts another few questions which will come to in due course when I open this box <laughs> um, but it, aside from some of the server hardware that you will find it lacks quite a number of features that you would find on the G5 principle among them is remote monitoring and also uh, intelligent provisioning which we will go through when we get this this beast hooked up I think the gen 8 servers which replaced these did have um, remote management but the gen 10s I don't think there was a gen 9 micro server I could be wrong the Gen 10 microserver, not the Gen 10 Plus, we'll come to that, the Gen 10 didn't have remote management on it. Now remote management um, is different for each manufacturer. Um, it performs pretty much the same functions, ish, give or take a bit, and um, each manager, call, each company, each manufacturer calls their remote management by something different. Hewlett Packard call it integrated lights out or ILO for short. Dell call theirs um, Dell Remote Access Console, I think. DRAC. Um, Cisco call theirs something else. Oh, <laughs> pretty much everybody calls their remote management different things, which can get confusing. But um, pretty much be assured that when I mention ILO, which is what I'll be talking about you know I, I'm HP orientated so unfortunately those are the acronyms I tend to gravitate towards um, I'm talking about remote management and although HP do have some specifics about their remote management um, there are similar features on other manufacturers equipment so um, I don't know about the Gen 8 microserver, but the Gen 10 microserver, I believe, was also nobbled. Um, pretty much there are four bays usually in these microservers, and what it said is that um, bays 0 and 1 SATA channels operate at the full 6 megabit per second. 
channels 2 and 3 are operating at 3 megabits per second. And I've been reading stories of people with the Gen 10 microservers installing their own um, controllers and getting busy with a soldering iron. Not the best. <laughs> I have actually been through the Gen 10 microserver manual to try and bottom this out and I haven't been able to. One of my colleagues does have a Gen 10 microserver, at least one, and I've asked him if at some convenient point he can nip into the BIOS and actually confirm what speeds uh, those are running at. So I might have some news to bring you at some point in the distant future. <laughs> but that's pretty much all more or less in the past. This puppy um, is a replacement. Now I already know several things that I'm going to be telling you because I've already been through it. <laughs> um, behind me used to be um, a Cisco NAS. Um, however, what's happened in the meantime is that things have not exactly gone well. It's, um, I had another server which also died and a friend who had the, this, this Cisco NAS, it had already done 10 years of service for her. When she gave it to me, I got another two years worth of service out of it before the flash uh, that was on board that contains the operating system died. One of the problems with um, those NAS units is that um, the flash typically comes on a reasonably proprietary-ish card, which is then connected via USB. So it's effectively USB um, flash storage. And when the system starts, it decompresses that flash image into RAM, and that's what it runs. But obviously flash, like everything else, has a limit. And it died. Oh well. So I had to replace it. And you'll note behind me, ta-da, is a HP Gen 10 Plus server, which I've already been through various bits and pieces with um, in order to progress a few things. <coughs> and that is what's in here. Another one to replace this one. It's done nine years. Um, I can't expect too much of it. Um, you know, it, it's done me proud for the poultry price I paid for it. This one is, um, I'll have to put the SKU on um, in the hoo-ha bar. There will be other links in the hoo-ha bar as well, um, which is what I do. And also check the comments because um, there's other people um, involved in these things and expect a few extra comments to get, you know, you know. so as usual, um, people usually throw in a few penneth, so come back and check the comments to see if anybody's um, had anything extra to say and correct me on a few things that I get wrong. Now, this particular SKU cost about £1,200. If you shop around, you can find it for a bit more or a bit less. And you've got a decision to make on where you shop it. Shop for it on. <laughs> the thing with a bog standard PC is that you can typically go to Asus, Gigabyte, whoever, and even though the motherboard or whatever it is that you're operating is years out of service, you can still probably find the latest or last firmware on their websites. And you can download and apply them and all the rest of that good jazz. When you're dealing with commercial sites of things, it's a different kettle of fish, and it's not always a constant kettle of fish either. If you buy things on a consumer basis, you're usually protected by laws. It's, what is it, the Consumer Rights Act or the Sale of Goods Act? I'm not sure what it is. It changed recently, a few years ago. But you have that protection. If you decide to get these things through commercial channels, then you probably will not get the same kind of benefit of protection. You may not be protected by the Sale of Goods Act. You're going to have to do your research and think long and hard. You may be able to find it a couple of hundred quid cheaper uh, in a commercial channel, but um, 
are you willing to uh, forego the protection um, that the Seals of Good Act will give you, or whatever it is in your country? You've got to do your research. The other thing is that the commercial enterprises, because this is an enterprise box, yeah, it, it, it's a proper server um, with all the jazz that it comes with, as I'll show you. But um, there are limits. Now, I don't really know how far these limits are pushable. Because where I've worked and I've been dealing with HP kits, we've typically got the necessary support contracts in place. You know, we've paid for the support. I mean, this out of the box comes with one year of support and it's good support at that. I, I will not decry the support. I can just jump on. The, I've had to make, you don't have to do this, but I, um, I made an account, um, registered the serial numbers to me and the one year of support on these boxes gave me the ability to just fire up a chat window and I was talking with the Hewlett Packard Enterprise engineer. That is the kind of thing that you get on a support contract for commercial equipment that you do not get on the consumer side. <laughs> um, but I've only got a year and there is a, a bit of a trick coming up with certificates which we will go through um, which is why I had to get this one fired up and get some questions answered uh, because I knew what <laughs> I knew what was going to happen so you got to think about these things and once that support contract expires what happens can you still get the necessary firmware upgrades can you get the um, the patch CDs can, can you get but what kind of support happens or can you still get the necessary firmware and security updates when your support contract expires because I'm not going to be able to support I'm, I'm not going to be able to afford another a HP um, support package once the support on these ends and that's the kind of thing that you've got to think about um, it's a decision that you've got to make <coughs> and th the exact details will vary with different manufacturers and um, 12 months from now I'll probably have to uh, give you an update on how far that goes <coughs> but there's nothing to say you've got to do that you can just get the thing out of the box you haven't got to patch it you haven't got to do anything you can just use it um, until it dies and um, <coughs> so you haven't got to, to register with Hewlett Packard <coughs> or Dell sorry my throat's giving it uh, grief you haven't got to do any of that. Um, it's purely up to you. <coughs> Normally this stuff comes out and um, for the average home user, the kind of thing that we use it for, the firmware is usually good enough. It's usually when you push things that um, that you normally find that there are holes in the firmware. <coughs> um, so it's a decision you've got to make. So that's the trick here. Consumer grade comes with its benefits and its downsides. Um, enterprise server grade has its upsides and downsides. And those are the kinds of decisions you've got to make. So let's open this puppy up. <coughs> Doing this very well, am I? <laughs> Come on, thank you. Right, what we have? Da -da 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 -da. I'm just checking how much I can see. I think you can see the whole box. If you go the commercial route, you can expect an awful lot for your money. As in a lot for your money, but not a lot of extra fluff, if you know what I mean. There's no flashy um, Hewlett Packard logos that you can, um, stickers that you can stick on things. No, oh, no. We have the usual um, start here, setup information for the HP ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus. All important documentation. And this will tell you where to get the stuff. I've already signed up, I don't need that. 
you have the usual safety compliance and warranty information don't need that I've already signed up <coughs> and here you have the external power supply plus um, a euro power supply power and UK and we do have um, what I believe are sticky feet so if you decide to put it on its end you can nothing's stopping you now one of the links in the hoo-ha bar will be to um, I think uh, the channel server for home or something and they discuss um, this server the 10 plus and the various things that you can do with it you can change things you can change the um, processor you can change the memory because I think this supports up to 32 gig of uh, 3000 speed memory but I think this particular SKU has come with 16 gig of 2600 ish should have we shall take a look when we get into the ILO That's a lot of desiccant, not to eat. <coughs> and this, ladies and gentlemen, is the server which I've been hoping to hold in my hands for some time. Well, in addition to that one. Haha. <laughs> the um, server comes on the back. You can see, um, you're probably going to see it in other videos better than you'll see it here. You will see what looks like two expansion slots on the right hand side of the back um, up here there's only one of them is actually an expansion slot the other one is for the ILO enablement card you can see four uh, gigabit ethernet ports on there which are for the operating system and you can also see the power in and you'll also see the display even this late of a server still has a VGA it does have um, display port as well um, but you know VGA seems to be the key thing <coughs> about this you've also got four USB um, 3 slots on the back and there's a couple of USB 3 slots on the front as well although they're colored black instead of blue I mean the color never actually matters anyway <laughs> the front um, you actually pull the bottom forward and the bottom comes forward then there's a clip at the top and then it lifts off um, inside here I'm actually going to put um, this stuff very well known but so well known that I've forgotten the name <laughs> and this will help um, keep some of the um, dust at bay from getting in here in the first place um, which is quite important um, the other thing that this is, does have is also status LEDs. Uh, many of the other microservers don't have it, so if a, if a drive fails, th there's no, th there was on those, there's no way to actually tell a status LED. I've got to look at a web page, which I do every day, um, to see if anything's gone wrong. But that's that. <coughs> and you, as you can see, there's four bays in here. There are um, pegs screw pegs and you've got eight, eight on each side four per drive so you screw the pegs in to the side of each drive and you push the drive in so that's how it works this one has an extra fifth channel on it this doesn't there's no DVD drive on here so that sort of begs you um, to a question of how do you configure it now I will be doing um, one drive with operating system, three drives for RAID 5. That's going to be fast enough for me. If you actually wanted to do two mirrored drives in order to get high speed out of it, you're sort of not doing yourself that much of a favor if your operating speed is actually going to be as a file server out the network port because you've only got a gig at the back if you want faster then you're going to have to use the one expansion slot the half height expansion slot to install something like a 10 gig fiber card or a 40 gig fiber card whatever you want 
Um, but then you've got the problem is that, that if these are your data drives, what are you going to do for boot drive? And that's usually taken care of by um, putting um, a USB drive on one of the USB um, ports at the back. That's how people typically get around these things. Um, returning to the modifications, this is your limitation. You can follow the link um, to the server server for home or whoever they are and it will give you a list of the various processors and memory combinations that they've tried but if you're going to start running stuff like 7200 rpm drives and upgrade the processor to the fastest you can get this is going to be a weak link and you could be stressing things too far be warned i myself will not be altering any of this the processor and memory combination will typically stay as it is. So, um, you've got to think about how you want to configure these sorts of things. So, it is coming. There's an ILO. In order for remote management to work, I mean, there's a chip in here. For remote management to work, it has to be typically very close to um, the system that it's monitoring. And the ILO chip is actually on the system itself. But, there's always a catch. In most of your um, rack mount servers, what you'll find is that ILO comes, comes with it. You get a basic version of ILO. There are some features, however, that uh, will not activate until you buy a license. That unlocks the extra features. With this server, however, it's different. The ILO is on board, but you can't access it. You need to buy an ILO enablement card. This slots in the top of the two slots, which is why, you, why you're limited on that one. It's specifically for the ILO. Um, I don't think that it can be used. I may be wrong, but I don't believe that that can be used as, a, as, as an express port. Um, and this will give you the ILO network interface that you can then use. So this is going to be installed. It's relatively easy. Um, there are two thumb screws at the back of here. I just undo the thumb screws and the top will come off. Then there's another two uh, black screws. Bring those out and the, um, the system board will come out of the back. Then I can just screw this in and away I go. And just put it all back together again. So it's relatively straightforward, and that will give me access um, to ILO. There are various gotchas um, on this. Because they've done the licensing that way, in other words, you've paid for ILO, but you haven't got it until you pay the license, which is the piece of hardware that is your license in this case. There are extra licenses, we'll come on to that as well. Um, it's, uh, what do you really say? It's, um, it, it's an interesting way of doing things, but, um, ILO is remote management is always on. It's a computer in its own right. So what you will find is that even as long as you have power applied to the server, the ILO card and the ILO chip will be active and you can talk to them. They will have their own network identity. They have their own net name on the, I uh, on the network, the host name. They have their own host name. Typically people put the, the host name of the server dash ILO at the end of it. Um, and it will always be running. Even if you shut the server down, remote management is there and you can actually use the remote management to bring it back up. What that means is that when I actually put this server in, I don't need KVM. I don't need a monitor, mouse or keyboard. All I need are three cables. One is for power, one is for network for the ILO, and one is for network for the operating system. That's it. Quite a bonus. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is... Um, Obviously put the ILO card in, cable it up, um, get this ready and um, 
sorted up. There was one other thing that I wanted to show you, which is uh, this. This is an adapter. Now there are very, there are a number of different adapters um, that are out there. This will allow me to use an SSD as my primary drive. And this has got a hole there, you just slot it in there, screw it down, and then that SATA interface is at the right location, just need to bring it over a bit, is at the right location to go in just as if it was a three and a half inch drive. It works. There are other versions um, of this that Hewlett Packard made, which actually had some electronics in them. And um, there were some electronics that there was a bay in the middle and you put the SSD in the middle and it then has some electronics which go through to another front. They, they, they've got rid of that now. These, I think, from a company called Insight, only cost about six or seven pounds each plus a bit extra for VAT and some postage. And what I've done is I've got eight of them, four for each server. At the moment, only the boot drive is going to be SSD. But things are changing. Right now, the cost per terabyte for SSD is double that of spinning rust. But that is changing rapidly. And if I am looking at about a nine or ten year life cycle for this, I think that at some point during that life cycle, when the spinning rust fails, it's going to be replaced with SSD. And when that happens, I'm going to need the adapters. <laughs> so I, th I thought ahead there, because when that change happens, a lot of, of other people are going to be after these adapters as well. So while I had the opportunity, I decided to get them. And uh, yeah, so what I'm going to do is uh, put this in. Um, I'm also going to put, um, yeah, I'm just, just going to cable it up and um, find out what IP it's operating on. Incidentally, because ILO is on the motherboard already, the password for ILO is on a sticker underneath, which is also with the serial number. So the first thing you're going to need to do um, is to have a look at the sticker underneath, find out what the default ILO password is, um, because um, obviously if, if you're not going to bother with ILO, then you don't have to. And you don't have to, you know, you don't. You've still got access to intelligent provisioning and BIOS settings, as I'll show you. Um, and it's going to be a question as to whether or not ILO will actually bring you that much benefit. Um, certainly if you don't have ILO then you are going to need to put in a keyboard, video and mouse. <laughs> but because I'm using ILO I'm not going to need that. So I'm going to cable this lot up and get a browser session um, hooked up and we will go through um, what's on this th this thing. <laughs> yeah, I might even take you through installation of an operating system using ILO. Hmm. All good stuff. We're going to look at three things. ILO, remote console, intelligent provisioning, and BIOS settings. But obviously, you don't have to use ILO if you don't want to buy the module. <laughs> We're just going to go through it first because it's the gateway to the other two. Um, I have been on here uh, earlier because it picked up a DHCP address and rather than deal with it bouncing around to DHCP addresses, I logged on and gave it a fixed IP so I know where it is. Um, 192.168.0.6 in this case. And here we are talking with it. The server itself is powered down, as you will see. Now, what I do need is the default password. Uh, all this will change once I finish this video. But the default logon name is administrator and you use the password which is found underneath the unit. Now, I will sound you a little bit of a warning. If you buy a new server and you go on to ILO um, without having turned the server on, 
it will uh, tell you that there are um, failures, that it is degraded, which can cause you a little bit of a heart attack if you're not ready for it. But what that means is that um, ILO and all the rest of it would have been reset after it left the factory. And in that case, certain uh, things like RAM, etc. can only be accessed by ILO when the system is powered up. So if you go into ILO and the system hasn't been powered up after it's been reset from the factory, then it's going to have forgotten all about the onboard memory and the rest of it. And it will have said, ah, we're degraded. So don't panic about that. There is another um, common instance when it will suddenly go degraded. And that is if you unplug a network port. Um, because ILO, as far as it's concerned, everything is working fine. Um, there are network ports in use and all of a sudden one of the network ports is not in use anymore and it will go, oh dear, degraded. So that's something else to watch out for. But you can see um, in here the standard things you will see. I believe that this ILO is actually a full ILO version, which means it should be, I believe, the same version that you will find on the big rack mount servers. But because this is not a big rack mount server, certain things will not work in this version. Well, in this version, but not on the server. Duh. <laughs> on the left hand side, you can see the usual. We've got some menus which we will go through. Uh, information, system information, rather confusing, two lots of information. <laughs> Uh, right down to lifecycle management. <coughs> down in the bottom left, we have a remote console. Now, on the rack mount servers, what used to be is that the basic ILO that came with it would not include the remote console. You would have to go for and, and pay for an extra um, license in order to then have the remote console. With this, it's here. And that's one of the key things that I like about this. Along the top right, you can see a series of icons and we actually have power control here and we have a momentary press in this case because that's all we can do, the system's off. You have a UID, um, unit identifier. What that is, is on the front and back of a server is an LED and if it's on, you can then um, work out which one it is by which one is actually lit. Um, <clears throat> there isn't one on this server by the looks of it. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll find it on the rack mount servers when you've got rack mounts of huge amounts of servers and you work on know which one is this. But on the micro server, it doesn't appear to be there. This is your server health. At the moment, it's saying OK. This will be showing uh, yellow if you've come into here and it's saying that something's degraded. So don't panic. You have the health LED. Um, I'm not sure that there is actually a health LED um, on the front of this one. I'm going to have to research which LED is which, but hey ho. Um, ILO health, that's the health of ILO itself. You have some um, ILO security risks to take care of. You have user account actions, logout sessions and settings. Sessions because more than one person can be logged into ILO at any one time, particularly on commercial boxes. And you have context sensitive help. If you ask for help, the page that you will get is, as you see via the IP address, <coughs> it is actually on ILO itself. And the various information it will give you depends on what page you are actually on. And it will tell you all about uh, what to find here and the various bits and pieces and um, the various things you can do and um, uh, icons. <laughs> Not on this one, apparently. Must be one of the others. But there is help available for you, uh, contact sensitive, and it's on the server, so you haven't got to load anything else. Well, it's on ILO. <coughs> so we'll take a look. Uh, this gives us all about the server and the product name. If it's got a server name, we haven't set one yet. A system ROM, system date, redundant system ROM. It's got a, it has a redundant system ROM on it. Server number, product ID, UUID and then access to the remote console, which you can ha actually do by clicking down on the remote console itself anyway. So uh, then you have ILO, its IP address, link local IPv6, ILO hostname, 
dedicated network port, shared network port, virtual NIC, uh, license type, which is ILO Essentials in this case, ILO firmware version, which is 2.72, we're going to upgrade that in a bit, and the ILO date and time. Server health, health LED, ILO health, ILO security, server power, which is currently off, UID indicator, which is off, it's not there. There's no trusted platform module, no TPM there. Um, micro SD flash memory card is not supported because some servers, um, particularly for running virtual environments, actually have um, flash memory on board. So rather than store the operating system on another drive, um, there's actually just some flash memory on board. <laughs> Uh, that's a bit, you know, contentious. People have their views on this. Connection to HPE, this is not registered, and I don't think it can be without a license. And you've got AMS not available. No problem. You have the security dashboard. And I think this is, if you clicked on the red shield up here, this is what you would it would take you to. And it's got various things, which it's, it's flagging as a risk. The default SSL certificate is in use. It is a risk. Um, I know that, but because um, we don't have a certificate author authority, we're just going to tell it to ignore that risk. SNMP version 1 is a risk. It's enabled. We're actually just going to go in and turn it off. So we're going to turn off SNMP version 1. That's, that's saved. And we're going to go back to the security dashboard. So now it should be saying that that one is taken care of. Password complexity is disabled. That's fair enough. Um, secure boot is disabled. That's fine. We're not worried about that either. And require login for ILO RBSU. Remote, um, I forgot what it actually says, but we're going to ignore that one as well. With all those ignored, um, security risk should turn to green. Overall security status ignored and it turns yellow which rather than green because we haven't dealt with a number of these things but there is a minimum password length or authentication failure logging you know this stuff will matter uh, and we've also disabled SNMP version 1 so it's happy with that obviously if you were in um, a commercial environment it would be a different thing session list just tells you what sessions are open on ILO in this case we only have one which is us there is an ILO event log and uh, you can see the stuff that I did yesterday and today. And you will also see things from um, the 28th to the 2nd, 2023, um, which is when the server was uh, totally reset by administrator and then the flash was restarted and the server power removed. <laughs> that was it, presumably in the factory or somewhere, being reset before it was shipped. You also have the integrated man management log. <clears throat> which typically says uh, typical things as well. Uh, you have I'm IML cleared um, by system administrator and then a uh, network was removed and that was it. And we have a uh, gigabit connectivity status for adapter in slot zero port one. You've got four um, ports at the back of this, but we're only using one. You have a security log, um, which will tell you various bits and pieces and who did what, last update, security login, and who's been doing what. Um, so as you can see, this is pretty heavy detail, <laughs> which you would expect to find. Um, any contact information you've got for this server, and all the rest of that stuff. And you can download that as well, if you need. Um, uh, so you can download the active health system log. What happens is, if you contact Hula Packard and you say you've got a problem, uh, they will ask for um, the health system log. You say um, the from and to dates and you download the log. So you put your contact information in, then you download the log and send it to HP. They'll diagnose it for you. And then you have diagnostics, which in this case um, is saying that everything's fine. ILO self-test results. It's happy. <laughs> Controller firmware version, EEPROM, it's happy. And you can, from here, if you wish, reset um, ILO. That is information. System information is slightly different. You have the summary. And if you start this up uh, before you've started the server, after an ILO reset, then it will tell you that memory is degraded. And a few other things in here will also not be there <laughs> because 
it needs it to be powered on to get that information. As it gives you a very handy warning, the server is powered off. Some system health information is current as of the last power off. So it's saying that memory is OK, but because the server's off, that's what it was when it was last powered down. You have the processors. And that tells you what the processor name is, uh, the processor speed. Um, we've got four cores on here, four threads, 64-bit capable, 3.4 megahertz. Uh, the cache, the internal cache of this. Um, there is another processor. It's slightly faster, but it's only got two cores on it. Um, this tends to be the one that people go for, the Xeon. Memory. Um, it will tell you what's in there. Processor 1 has two memory slots, total memory 16 gig. The current operating frequency is 2667 megahertz. Um, physical memory, PROC 1, DIM 2. Good in use, 16 gig. Uh, maximum supported frequency is uh, 3200. UDIM technology. And you can show the empty memory slots in here as well. So there's an empty uh, memory slot in here. I could probably get another one of these dims and knock it up to 32, no problem. Network. Physical network adapters. We only have one, which is okay. The others are unknown because <laughs> there's nothing plugged into them. Device inventory. Um, it's telling you roughly what's on there. Uh, embedded video controller on board. Um, the um, LOM is connected. SATA, embedded controller, firmware version not available, unknown because it's powered off. And the storage, um, which is on board. Now, as again, the server's powered off. It can't tell you what's going on. <laughs> no drives were found in the system. You may need to reboot the host to discover them. Hey-ho. Firmware and um, software. This will tell you the various firmware that's on board, um, its version and its location you will notice that there is embedded SATA, embedded device, um, system board, and embedded LOM. <laughs> so that's where the firmware is and what versions they are. You can update them. And we're actually going to do some of that now. Well, in a minute. You also have software. Now, the software, the server's powered off. Some of this will only show here when, it, when it's there. You have maintenance windows that you can set. You have an ILO repository, which is what's in here. And you can see ILO 5 is version 2.72, system BIOS is U48, system programmable logic device 09. Installation sets, um, the system recovery set. So that's what that is. <laughs> and the installation queue, which currently is empty. So um, once you have your um, firmware downloaded, you can update. And we are going to update some of this firmware right now. And we're going to take it from a local file because I've got it on this machine. And we're going to choose it and it's downloads uh, Gen 10. And we are going to go for um, the ILO 5, which is now going to be taken up to 2.81. And we're going to choose that. And um, update the recovery set. No, there is no recovery set I, don't set, I don't think. So that is now going to upload the firmware. So it's receiving the file. It's then going to check it make sure it is happy, and then reset ILO. Now, you can do work on ILO without causing the main system itself to reboot. ILO will reboot, but that won't take the main server down with it. So it's verifying it, and it's flashing it, which is just going to take a few moments, and then ILO is going to reset. Now, when it comes to the OS software, that does require a reboot. And I'm going to show you that after ILO has finished updating itself. There is also um, a CD that you can download. Um, I've downloaded the latest one, but um, it's actually some of it is actually behind the firmware that I'm loading now. So I'm going to give it another few months and then see what they've updated. You can um, do individual components like I'm doing here. Um, or you can download uh, one of the um, CD images. 
um, if you've got one of these, um, set a date in your diary um, a, a, a couple of weeks before the server goes out of support to make sure that you have um, the latest ones, uh, to, to make sure you've got the latest that you can get your, ha your hands on, because there's no guarantee um, of the possibility that um, <laughs> that this is actually going to, that you're going to have access to it, uh, to any of the firmware or software once the server is out of support. We're going to take a couple of quick looks at some images. Um, this is um, on the right you have the Gen 10 Plus, on the left you have the Gen 10 and you can see some differences immediately. Um, on the Gen 10 it looks like the processor is actually soldered on board. Uh, on the Gen 10 Plus it's socketed. There is one thing that I forgot to mention. I mean, if you're one of those people who um, listens to these videos and doesn't and uh, doesn't watch the video um, I did have a pop-up to show uh, to say that there is an onboard USB 2 interface on the motherboard so you can actually put um, as you can see on the left somebody does actually have a USB memory stick in the onboard slot in the motherboard on that one and you can do the same here so if you want to use all four bays for hard drives you can actually run an operating system off a memory stick which you can stick on board um, via the USB 2 controller without needing to stick anything out of the back of the system and as you can see here um, you can just look up various things you have um, the riser board connection number two there's the ILO chip itself three is obviously the processor, four is the memory, five is the USB, uh, USB 2 type A port, the rest of them USB type 3, you've got the trusted module connector and then you've got the system fan, big ass piece of kit there's, that is. So that is um, another look at that, um, boom, uh, ILO has just finished uploading the firmware and now as you can see by the, um, by the icon it's in the process of restarting. Um, when that uh, green thing stops running around, we should be able to then log on. Logged out, ILO is being reset, blah blah. <sighs> Takes its time, doesn't it? This is the boring stuff. Getting it set up when you've only just had it. It'll eventually come back in a minute. Eventually. <laughs> Takes its time. There we go. It's done. Please clear the browser cache before continuing. And there we go. We can now log in again. <coughs> that's going to take us back in and as you can see on the top left we have 2.81 we'll go back to the uh, firmware and we're going to upload um, some software update firmware, local file, choose file downloads, uh, gen 10 um, this is going to be the SPS update as you can see it's FWPKG. So we're going to do that. And what's it going to say? Updating the firmware will cause it to reboot. Then it goes uploading the firmware image. And it says firmware update. That was not successful. Make sure you're using blah, 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 blah. That's because it needs to be added to the queue. <laughs> so this particular one. Uh, we've got to upload it. Uh, different firmware takes different types. So we're going to upload that to the repository. Saving the image. eventually <laughs> done so we're going to add it to the queue so that is the one that we've just uh, uploaded SPS 
ROM flash firmware package, that's what we've uploaded. And we're going to um, just put it in the key. Oh, task name, SPS patch update. So we're going to add that to the queue. Now if we take a look at the installation queue, we'll find that software is ready to be added pending. So um, we're going to take a look at the remote console. Now you've got uh, three pretty much versions here, HTML5, .NET and Java Web Start. Um, I typically go for the HTML5. It should open in this window. Bingo. The one problem with the HTML5 is you can't take it outside the window that you're looking at. <laughs> so what we need to do is uh, this will happen immediately after the associated updated checks. So we are now going to power the system on. Now what you're going to see, because I have an image here, is something like this. You can see that it is um, typically uh, a bit more advanced than your average um, post screen. I've done this so we can talk about it before I actually hit the button. And you can see that it's going through various things here. Um, it will go through the installed system memory, give you details on the processor. Now you have a workload profile, which in our case is general power efficient compute. We'll come on to that later. The power regulator mode, boot mode, UEFI. Um, it tells you the ILO IP here. So if you um, can't work out where ILO is, you can always take a look at the server while it's starting and it'll tell you. Here are the options for F9 system utilities and F10 intelligent provisioning. This won't come up immediately until a certain point in the boot. Post. <laughs> and you can see various things here. I've got various uh, checks. C of Sensors 3D, Intelligent Provisioning, HPI Rest, HPE RESTful API, ILO Management Engine, ILO Essentials, Agentless Management. The Smart Array we're not using because we're using Z, going to be using ZFS and you have the Server Configuration Lock which we haven't got enabled. <coughs> Obviously, <laughs> um, in a commercial environment you'd be um, using different things and yada yada blah. So, uh, we're now going to start and you will see what changes here as we start it. So I'm going to momentary press. Are you sure? Yes. And now it's going to start up. As it does that, um, yep, there we go. We have others. Press and hold, uh, cold boot and reset, which you can see there. And now the system is going through post. Memory initialization. Uh, you got the IP um, addresses there for ILO 5. Um, <coughs> pending SPS update. Sometimes it's better to do some of these. Um, well, you've got choices, basically. Uh, in order to use intelligent provisioning, um, the system's got to be up and you've got to be in a boot process, which means the system is not running. It cannot be doing a load. If you come here and put stuff in an installation queue, it will happen the next time the server restarts which is, let's say, for updates or whatever. And that's going to happen. So it's going through everything, processor initialization, blah, blah. Uh, all the rest of that good jazz. Sending output to this, that, and the other. <laughs> and here we go. At the moment, we could press F9 or F10. We're not going to do that in this case. Uh, you've also got a boot menu and a network boot, by the way. We are going to go into these a bit later. <sighs> this is still showing as pending here. RESTful Firmware Update Manager is now starting. So you see we've got a, a pending task in here for it and you will see um, the status in the queue change. Let's just get rid of that. We don't want to restart the server just yet. <laughs> In progress. There you go. It's changed. The file was read successfully. Applying the firmware update. Please wait.
boring in it. So ILO does have uh, a number of uses um, beyond simply remote control. <coughs> it can give you some very useful information, um, but you know you can do without it. You don't ultimately need it if you don't want to have it. <sighs> but this saves me from having extra cables and needing the KVM. <coughs> In theory, you could have one of these and stick it up the attic. <laughs> Network cables having like 100 meters range, um, as opposed to the kind of range you'd need for a KVM, you, you've, you can obviously put these further away. Um, you can obviously, uh, because you're addressing it via uh, a web browser, you could you could do stuff over the internet. You know, <laughs> remote offices, all the rest of that stuff. That's the kind of places that these things are used for. And if you get a report that something's wrong with the server, the first thing you can do is jump on ILO. <sighs> you haven't got to physically visit the machine. Um, there are links in the hoo-ha bar. Um, I've put a link into where you can find this server in this particular configuration for just slightly less than a thousand pounds. I haven't bought from them myself. Um, so do your research also um, where to get the other bits and pieces and the part numbers that I was mentioning earlier on in the video and also some of the links to some of the software firmware update completed successfully that is now marked as complete BIOS configuration was modified system will restart reboot for configuration changes to take effect and now it's going to reboot. <coughs> and you can obviously hear the fans behind me ramping up. Yeah, I think you can hear those. So I'm going to let this finish. I'm going to turn it off and finish off looking at ILO. There we go again. It's done what it needs to. And some of this, st <laughs> some of this stuff can have you in a panic. You're going to, oh my God, it's caught in a loop. And then you can just go off in a panic. <laughs> Now this is going to stay um, on top of everything so I'm just going to minimize that a bit while it's doing what it's doing. ILO Federation um, group membership for the for the ILO you've obviously got federation that you can use if you need to multicast discovery um, the default group membership is everything but we're not using it. <laughs> uh, group firmware update and licensing multi-system map we're not using ILO Federation, basically. Remote console and media. Um, general information, where it is. The console port is 17990. Uh, .NET integrated. If you want to use that one, you can get the console there. We're using HTML5, which you can just launch. And I think, oh, launch it in a new window. That's interesting. Can I do this? Remote console is in use. Retry it. Yay, we have a remote console and a new window. Ah, fancy that. You learn something new every day. <laughs> so I have it off to the left and I can bring that in when I need to. 
or you have Java Integrated Web uh, Remote Console. You also have an HPL, HPE ILO mobile app. Yes, you can control your server via an app on your mobile phone. <laughs> and you also have virtual media, hotkeys and security. Um, some of which requires a license. <laughs> hmm. Hotkeys. Yep. Um, you can actually use hotkeys and you can assign a number of key presses to um, six different hotkey combinations. When a hotkey is pressed during a remote control session, the selected key combination will be all keys pressed at the same time uh, will be transmitted in its place. Then you have security. Uh, blah, blah. Um, the server is currently doing um, that is trying to find the boot. So I'm just going to um, power the thing off. Um, uh, press and hold. That will now turn the server off. And that will just go boom. Or it should. <laughs> Come on, computer. Turn off. There you go. Gone. It's off. And I think you can see that here. Virtual media, virtual keyboard menu. And it should say down here, power off. So, uh, remote console, computer lock settings, integrated remote console, trust settings, blah, blah. Um, it enhances the security of the server by automatically locking an operating system when a remote control session ends or when the network link to ILO is lost. So you can, you've got that as well. Power and thermal. This is one of the um, interesting parts, which is a bit knackered because um, as far as the power is concerned, it's running from an external power brick. So you can't get various features on here. But you can see um, system power restore settings are in here. Uh, power on delay. I'll put a 15 second delay in. Uh, we'll apply that. Um, you can also do a power on from here. Um, there's multiple places to do this. Power meter shouldn't respond with anything, I think, because it's not available for this configuration. Power settings. Now, this... Um, we have dynamic power saving mode. You can have static low power, static high performance or OS control and uh, SNMP alert on breach of thro power threshold. So you can actually put a threshold in there if this was actually doing it, but I don't think it can. I'm just going to momentarily press this and turn it back on for a sec. Um, just in case you actually get this, because I don't think you can. Power. It's starting up, but I don't think it's going to tell us anything. Server's now starting. Yeah, present power reading not available. Um, will it actually give us uh, this one's post is complete? I don't know. Uh, very interesting. I don't think it will, but if it is, it's going to do that. You have the fans in here. Uh, we'll come back to power. Oh, goad. <laughs> Fan, location, redundant status and speed, and temperatures. It should be able to give us the temperatures anyway, which it can. This is just starting up, so there's no load, load on it, so we've got a nice graph here with the various sensors and what they're responding with. So we've got 12 sensors uh, on board here. You've got the front of server, back of server, 3D graph, and uh, all that stuff is telling you what te the, the tech current reading is. Uh, the LOM is reading 50 degrees C. Um, and there are caution warnings, caution thresholds, and critical thresholds uh, for each of these components. Uh, will it refresh? I don't know. There's no actual operating system running on here at the moment. Do we have fans? It's still in post, so I'm not sure if we'll get this. Should have turned it off. Oh, well, I'm an idiot. <coughs> yes. We have fan 1, which is at the back of the unit. It's no redundancy. The status is OK, and whatever the speed is. Overall status OK, there's no redundancy on this small server. Optimal cooling is the thermal configuration. Power, I'm not sure we're going to get. No. It knows there's a power supply good in use, but it can't actually talk with the power supply itself. So, all it knows is, yeah. I got power. 
um, post is now complete and it's looking for a uh, for a boot for um, it is it's scanning the network <laughs> for which there's nothing there <laughs> so power readings it obviously can't do it but that's some interesting information on temperatures we should hopefully get some more information now yeah there we go that's a bit more like it um, click to expand collapse long core so you can see what's going on where they are there's a couple more that haven't re reported yet but you can see um, show the missing sensors there you go so you can have back view 3d or um, 2d if you wish all good stuff the dedicated network port um, is where I went into earlier and um, that basically tells you what's going on its current link speed is a gig auto negotiate full duplex blah 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 H uh, DHCP six status is not there um, general information uh, the hostname settings now in theory if I change this um, This is actually something that I need to do. We've got no domain name. Nix settings use the dedicated network port. So you can, you've got control over the Nix settings here. We're just going to apply this. Um, and we're going to see what happens. In theory, this should reboot. Uh, the pending network configurations won't take effect until ILO is reset. But what I'm looking for is the certificate. So we're going to reset this in a bit uh, because we're going to come to the certificate. So you've got your IP um, v4 settings um, I obviously um, switched off the HTTP and gave it a static address you got the DNS servers wins configurations and you've got your static root configuration uh, you have similar for IPv6 um, I actually turned the thing off uh, don't use IPv6 first it's not here uh, don't um, enable stateless auto configuration don't enable the HTTP 6 so basically that's about it Enable the DNS server registration, don't bother. And that's about it for, for that. Um, SNTP. Uh, if you're running SNTP, obviously that can do it. There are pending network configurations. And you have a shared network port. Um, now, <clears throat> it would be possible um, to actually get ILO to share the same network port as the operating system. But on this particular uh, configuration, um, I'm, I'm just going to check the security for, the, for a second on this and SSL certificate. Um, we can see that this is um, default to that CN. Uh, do not trust, blah, blah, valid from February 27th. So we're now just going to go into this and I'm going to tell it to reset uh, yes reset because in theory it should also reset the certificate this is an ongoing discussion that I've got with HP support <laughs> trust me I find all this crap <laughs> the documentation says the certificate should be regenerated if the host name is changed um, that's probably not going to be the case here I think but um, yeah so it is possible to have ILO use the same network connection as the operating system. However, on this system, the ability to use ILO depends on your license, which is by that access card. So if they actually allowed you to do that on this system, you could effectively buy 10 servers, have the one access card, set it up so that everything talked on the same, and just you just pay for the license once. So that's why you can't do it. <laughs> so this is now refusing to connect. Uh, yeah. Because it's all resetting. Now in theory, it should reset that certificate according to them. But according to me, on the previous version, it didn't. Uh -huh. So you can see now the host name has actually changed. And we are going to go on it because we haven't changed the credentials. <laughs> Uh, 
and we're just going to take a look at the certificate no it's still February the, the 27th so and the issued two is still there <laughs> um, so this is on generate right we'll carry on um, so that's the shared network port and why you can't use it on this version so uh, remote support if you have a server room full of these things then you can uh, have uh, a HP remote support centralized host server in your local environment and then you can register the servers to that host server and then HPE can remote in and do what they need to do um, without you messing around with things and obviously there's no service events or data collections in here because we're not running it administration uh, you obviously have user administration in here uh, we only have the one user with full access uh, directory groups we're not actually running them because um, we're not tied into Active Directory uh, boot order this is an interesting one uh, you can um, actually say the boot mode and the boot order in here and it knows that the Samsung is there and or generic USB boot the generic USB boot will trigger before the networks in this case then it will go to the hard drive which is why it will take so long but you can adjust that and you have a one time boot status so um, you can have um, one time boot and set it so I could have the hard drive at the top of this list and say look for this next one time I just want you to boot off the USB storage device and it will happily do that for you um, and uh, for the one time you can tell it um, the target option uh, or you can actually boot to system setup utilities <laughs> which I think we're going to hit that button in a bit we'll see what happens licensing this automatically comes with ILO essentials already active if you wanted to activate the other features you could give it the activation key in here and install it that key would stay with this server you have a key manager for all the keys that have been generated uh, but you need a license for that language default language English um, default language and we've only got the one and firmware verification uh, a license is required <laughs> security access settings server name FQDN address ILO network um, all the um, update service we do not have uh, accept third-party firmware update packages that is disabled you can't see that because my head is over it but you can see all the other settings that are in here secure shell key is the shell key um, certificate mappings um, <laughs> authorized certificates um, they require a license you have smart card which I think is another license SSL certificate now this is an interesting one now we're actually going to force the SSL certificate <sighs> these microservers have really picked up for people like me who use them at home others um, some people use them as um, home virtual environments um, and they uh, you know they typically load VMware or whatever hypervisor they want and then use it that way that's the kind of scenario where you would find four high-speed high-spec drives in mirror configuration and you would be booting off USB and that's the kind of situation um, but how many of us have our own SSL certificates <laughs> you know SSL certificates get in the way um, of a lot of things they really screw things up and this is a self-signed certificate uh, which is fair enough and it is uh, obviously completely self-generated so there is no link to any form of trust and um, but unfortunately instead of giving it something like 20 or 30 years <laughs> they've only given it five they've only given it five years so if you don't renew this certificate before the five years has expired your ability to get in via ILO 5 may be screwed so you may lose access to this page so how do you reset it uh, you do have the options to import an SSL certificate and private key and automatically manage the SSL certificates uh, if you've got the license for it <laughs> yeah so you can uh, generate and import a certificate and private key if you wish um, but 
so there's nothing to stop you, I suppose, generating your own certificate for 20 years and importing that. But how many of us have really got, um, are really up on our certificates to do that? So how do you reset this? Well, you simply click remove. What happens is at the, at the right, you get a warning, but it says, are you sure you want to delete the current SSL certificate and reset ILO? A new default certificate will be generated after reset. Certificate generation might take several minutes. So if you click that, it will do it for you. And then you will get a new local certificate, which is valid from today's date. However, <clears throat> what do you do if that happens, has happened and you have forgotten uh, to get in in time to do it? What you can do is you can then um, SSH into it. You can secure a shell in and uh, at 192.168.06 is this one. So you can SSH into the box and we're going to accept this fingerprint. We're going to give it the password <coughs> and bingo, we're in. We're not into a standard Linux uh, interface. We are in to the ILO interface, which has their own sort of language. Um, you can issue a question mark and get information on the CLI commands, on the command line commands for ILO, among which are show. So if we show, uh, that's sort of the equivalent of a DIR, effectively. And that's what we've got, and we've effectively got map1 as a target. So if we CD into map1, and then do another show, you can see we've got a load of stuff under here. Among which is SSL Cert 1. <coughs> I'm now going to CD back to the root. Um, you don't have to do that. So all you have to do is issue delete. Uh, map one SS it hasn't got tabbed complete tabbed completion SSL cert one that will delete it so you can delete that certificate um, without um, needing to do this so session stopped and we're kicked off ILO will now be reset so now ILO is going through another reset we are done with that so let's get that out of the way. <coughs> So ILO is being reset. <laughs> um, we still we just got to wait for that green thing to finish, and then we can get back in again. And notice that the host name is still ILO blah blah changed. That's what I've just changed it to for a demo to prove things. Ah, <sighs> blah 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 blah. So yeah. Certificates um, have their bonuses, but they are a real pain because if a certificate runs out, um, that's it. Browsers, some browsers in some certificates situations will refuse to connect. And you can see that certificate is not valid. Um, this is still the old one. It's currently in the process of regenerating it. <coughs> now, according to HPE, engineers that's it. Uh, it it should automatically regenerate if you change the host name that doesn't seem to be what's happened however um, so we're just gonna wait for this to come back to us your connection is not private advanced proceed uh, we're just going to take a look at the certificate now and the certificate should say yep we have the new computer name and we have a new issued of today's date and time. Actually, the time is slightly out. No, it isn't. Yeah, it's slightly out by about a minute. We can take care of that. So there we go. So that's how you can uh, reset via SSH if you've lost, um, lost communication. Uh, where were we? We were under security and we were under SSL certificate. So there you go. We've got the new certificate generated. Bingo. And we've got another five years on the clock. <laughs> um, directory. I don't think there's much in the Active Directory. LDAP is currently disabled on here, unless you've got it. Directory server generate an LDAP. Um, so you've got those test and apply Kerberos settings if you're running Kerberos. How many of it are doing that at home? Um, encryption requires a license, um, HPSSO, single sign-on settings, 
uh, we haven't got that at the minute um, it's disabled a log on security banner you can change that if you want what the hey you can enable it this is a private system blah 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 you know commercial requirements uh, management you have SNMP settings here which you can set and uh, but where I'm not running anything on that you've got the SNMP version 3 settings alert mail now this is a good one <coughs> you can enable ILO alert mail recipient email address and then give the details of your email server um, and that pretty much is uh, it, you can just do that and if it hits a problem it can send you an email <laughs> that's very useful uh, remote syslog, uh, licensed compute ops management, Ugh. life cycle management, intelligent provisioning is now always on. Access intelligent provisioning from Milo browser any tiny time without having to reboot. <coughs> so that's it, always on. Decommission, um, that's a licensed feature. But the other thing you do also have is backup and restore. So you can back up um, your Milo configurations. Uh, ILO configuration and you can set a packet password for the file as well <coughs> so you can back up your other configuration to a local file that you can keep locally in case you need it and then um, sort that out one thing that I'm actually trying to look for here is actually um, SNTP that was it <laughs> use DHC port for time server and I want uh, SN MP time servers uh, pool.ntp.org and we'll just uh, server 0 and server 1 so we can primary that, secondary that apply and we are now using SNTP <laughs> I hope, what's that? reset ILO, oh Christ reset ILO again just use the time settings, come on and there you have it. That's ILO for you. Um, you've got some power there. Um, particularly useful is the remote ability to remote, so you don't need a KVM. Um, the ability to email you um, things, and um, the key thing is that certificate <laughs> is being able to reset that certificate if it blows and you haven't reset it. If it expires and you haven't reset it, you're going to have problems. <coughs> so. You know, it's a self-signed certificate. What more can you do? And that's about it. So that's all going to be... Um, now that this is doing what it's doing, um, later on, I'm going to go on to that. But we are now going to hit that button. Um, where's the default password? Obviously, after this, everything, all the default stuff is going to get changed anyway, so what the hey? <coughs> certificates reset, SSH keys reset, blah 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 blah. So now we are going to uh, we're actually going to do remote console and media and we're going to bring that into a new window and we're going to find that button uh, administration where was it? No, it, was, it wasn't a remote support, wasn't it? No. Uh, remote consoles and media. No. Was it under management? <laughs> Ugh. No. Alert, compute ops. Administration? No. Where the hell was it? Remote support? Service events? <coughs> Power and thermal? Nah. Wasn't under there. Wasn't under shared network. Where was it? <laughs> Language, firmware verification, licensing, boot order. Remote syslog? Ops. No, it was before here, wasn't it? Always on security. Access settings, certificate mapping. 
Mm. HPSSO. Single sign-on administration. Key manager licensing boot order. That may be in it. Yeah, boot to system setup utilities. One-time boot owner cannot be changed during post. Duh, because it's currently posting. It can't post because it's trying to start. It, it's, it's trying to find find something. No. Okay. <coughs> so we're going to reset. And during the reset, we are going to go into some of the settings. I'm just going to click inside the HTML5. And we're going to see some of the options in here. I think we'll go into intelligent provisioning first. I'm just looking at the time. And the time of this recording is coming up to an hour. I think I'm going to get mum, um, possibly have have a, have a word in my shell leg. <coughs> so when this gives us the options, we're going to go F9. In fact, we can just take that full screen. F9 system utilities. Come on, baby. Give me system utilities. There we go, it's gone. It's changed colour. It knows that's what we want. <coughs> Obviously up here you have a virtual keyboard if you need it. Uh, menu, power, preferences, info, show to status bar, I know host name, blah blah, virtual media, so you can actually attach a floppy or CD via a local ISO file if you wish from here and it will be accessible. So we have system configuration, one time boot menu, embedded application, system information, system health, exit and resume, uh, blah blah blah. So we have system in, in configuration, uh, ILO configuration, embedded ports, and uh, you have a configuration utility in here for ILO. So if you can get in here, um, sometimes you can uh, do things, switch things around. <coughs> yes, hello, you're supposed to be doing that. Whoa, gone too far. Network options, advanced network options, user management, settings options, set to refactory defaults or reset ILO. So if you absolutely go bonkers, that, that may or may not reset the certificate, I do not know about advanced network options for ILO so you can configure um, some of the ILO options from here um, advanced network options, user management and settings options so you have the ILO configuration utility there which is enabled and uh, show the ILO, ILO address during post local users and you have uh, ILO web interface enabled or di disabled you can do that from here <coughs> Um, BIOS platform configuration, RBSU, that's what RBSU stands for. <laughs> um, remote BIOS something blah. So this is where you get the options to switch various um, configurations. You have virtualization, power efficient, um, general throughput compute, and general power efficient compute, which is your average um, file server. Um, graphic processing, I.O. throughput, custom, so you can determine um, your own workload profile if you wish. You have various memory options, uh, refresh rate, bus frequency, all the rest of that good stuff. Um, the one that I'm after is, is it under network options, network boot options? And what I want to do is... Um, it's not actually in here. PCIe slot network boot. Uh, disabled. No. Um, yeah, we'll leave that uh, network boot and we'll do the um, boot configurations. <coughs> so you have those configurations there. Somewhere in here should be 
um, boot options, there it is. <laughs> boot order priority, UEFI boot settings. Um, boot order. Um, so that's the boot order. Where the heck is it? Boot order control. And I can take off the ticks for those. So we can save those. Yes, save changes. So you've got all sorts of things in there. Uh, more BIOS platform configuration, system configuration. So the system configuration, um, you can typically see you've got everything there. One time boot menu, system health. For system health, you can view the system health. <coughs> and it tells you what everything's going on. Not very much detail, but it basically tells you what's healthy and what's in trouble. <coughs> so that's the system utilities. Um, so we're going to exit, uh, save and exit. So that is the system utilities. Um, and we're going to want intelligent provisioning next. No bootable devices were detected. No kidding. <laughs> so we have now intelligent provisioning. This, um, no, no, don't, don't. <laughs> intelligent provisioning, smart storage administrator, server hardware di diagnostics and server hardware diagnostics full test full test so in here this is where you find your diags utilities your smart storage administrator if you wanted to use the onboard raid configuration for this thing or the intelligent provisioning now we are going to go for intelligent provisioning i hope <laughs> aha there we go <coughs> Double clicking wasn't good enough, it needed a keyboard interface. It needed me to press something. Obviously while you're in um, intelligent provisioning or system utilities, the, you're not running the operating system, the server is effectively down. This sometimes takes time for everything to load. As you can see it's following the mouse. <laughs> <coughs> One of the obvious questions is, how well does um, the remote console work with uh, graphical interfaces such as if you are loading a Windows server? I don't know. I don't know. It should work. Um, yeah, that telltale Mozilla Firefox came up there. And here we go. This takes a while. You have various options up here, system information, help, uh, language, or power. <coughs> <coughs> system information, uh, that's going to get us that. Application version, system maintenance switches, we're not using that. User list, firmware check, uh, if you wanted. So you got that, first time setup wizard. We're not going to use the first time setup wizard. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, we'll go through the first time setup wizard. English, US. You only have US. There's no UK in there. A lot of other things missing. Keyboard language. English, US. We're actually English, UK, but who cares? Um, system software update. Uh, HP website or custom URL. HP website. We need to change this. We're not in Morovia. We are in London. Um... Uh, Dublin, London. System time and date. Uh, we don't want to enable feedback. Who cares? We'll accept the intelligent provisioning license agreement. Uh, enable F10 functionality. This again is the part of the initial thing that you go through. Uh, what are you going to use it for? Uh, general power efficient compute. Um, general throughput compute um, is another one you may want to think about, but uh, it, it depends. You can provide anonymous usage and error feedback, enable application of software and firmware updates to the system. Um, don't necessarily want to do that. <coughs> Network update for updates and installs. DHCP auto configuration for IPv6. Um, uh, right, you can either turn it on or, yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> so that is 
that one which is currently linked the others are not hooked up that's ILO network configuration which we've already configured um, blah blah submit we already saved those settings and set them up <coughs> so give it a minute <laughs> reset the system for, for changes to take effect oh god so the first thing you actually probably want to do is just go for intelligent provisioning anyway rather than go into ILO <laughs> right here we go perform maintenance you've either got rapid setup uh, which we did or perform maintenance now you've got a number of things here. Uh, you've got a firmware update uh, from the cloud. You'll note the icon is a cloud. Um, <clears throat> what it does basically, it requires you to have an account with HP. Um, you generate a key and you put that key on a USB stick. Then when you fire this up, it'll look at the USB stick for the key which will authorize the updates. It couldn't get it to work and HP um, engineer said uh, we don't recommend that you use this to update firmware anyway. Okay. Intelligent provisioning preferences, active health system log, deployment settings. Um, uh, so you can uh, deploy um, a server rather than go through all this malarkey if you've got a lot of servers, servers to do. BIOS platform configuration, ILO configuration. Um, we've already been through ILO configuration pretty much. You've got one button secure arrays. <laughs> we'll arrays all user data on the server subsystems, including data stored on disks and NVMe. Mm. Yeah. Hardware valid. Um, <coughs> easy way to perform a hardware check on your system. RAID configuration. Um, you can get into the smart array from here and configure it. Uh, I'm not going to do that because there's no drive in here anyway. Intelligent storage configuration, uh, limited storage configuration through the REST API. Any changes made would require a reboot. System arrays and reset. Clears drive arrays, initializes local disks and clears preferences. <laughs> right. <coughs> so we'll go into this one. Basic settings, network settings. So this is your intelligent provision preferencing preferences. which I think we've pretty much already uh, we've already been in network settings I don't think there's that much in here really okay active health system log um, it downloads the active health system log from the server onto a USB key so you can send it to HPE so you again you've got the dates you can do this on ILO and uh, you can download that and download that file deployment settings um, as it says, you can edit a collection of the deployment settings, save them in a portable package, and then deploy them to the servers. You have BIOS settings in here. Um, as you, some of these you probably recognize from the previous F9 option. <coughs> uh, BIOS platform configuration, as you can see, we have uh, the workload profile, ROM information, um, system options, boot time optimizations, USB options, server availability. Um, so you've got these, you know, th these are starting to get into the usual stuff, USB options, um, server availability, uh, no settings found. I don't think we can do some of this ASR enabled. I didn't think this, this was actually here. Um, or can it now, it, some things are only accessible when the system is actually running. Diagnostics options, um, all the rest of that stuff where what I, I went to completely wrong there <laughs> I should have clicked further up rather than further down but uh, processor options enabled cores per processor um, processor times 2a IPC enabled cores per processor huh 
Tot totally uh, RBSU configuration. Um, virtualization options, boot options, network options, storage options, um, scan configured targets only, SATA controller options, uh, secure arrays disable. <laughs> um, you got loads of options here, which we won't totally go through all of them. Date and time, uh, daylight savings disabled. Uh, we're on Morocco, coordinated universal time. Um, there should be some something else. I think ILO may have taken care of the time and date. System default options, language settings, restore system um, options, power and performance options, collaborative power control, intelligent performance monitoring support. You've really got to link, uh, read into all these. Um, if, if you've got the time, I would say go into these, read up on all of them and make your choices. Um, especially if you're going to start running a few of these at home and especially if you're start, going to start running uh, the server as um, a virtual machine host because you're probably going to need to change a few of these. The workload profile itself will take care of a number of these things for you. Uh, memory options, uh, bus frequency, auto, refresh watermarks and uh, memory refresh one times. So that's your BIOS platform configuration. Just spend some time. Allo configuration, we've pretty much already done it. Uh, initial setup and configuration, already done that. Intelligent storage configuration, uh, limited storage configuration through the REST API. And there you have it. The So how do you do firmware updates if you can't do it via this? The newest firmware updates, um, it looks, uh, if I refresh this, it's going off and checking. The available is actually less than the current in all of these options because <laughs> uh, we've, we've updated everything uh, pretty much. Lights out is on 2.81. Um, you have to download uh, the service packs. Uh, the, the service pack at the moment, um, there is going to be a link to the service packs whether you're not going to be able to get them or not, I don't know. The latest one was October the 4th, 2022 which is why all this is is further out of date than what I've already applied. Read. When you're responsible for servers, read <laughs> is all I can say. Um, this is just a screenshot of this and you can see what versions uh, there are and what the upgrade requirements are uh, recommended. Recommends that this update at the earliest convenience includes support for other OS versions. So there are other things which you run on the operating system, which also talk back to the server. Yeah, um, some of this stuff you you can alter firmware from the operating system. So you need to follow this stuff, read the products in practice, which in my case is one, which is this server, <laughs> um, and it's the, the the service pack. You download the I/O uh, ISO, then you run the ISO, uh, you boot from that and that will do its job. You'll come into an interface which is similar than the intelligent provisioning, similar to the intelligent provisioning here, and that will uh, then guide you through what your options are. Um, do we have anything else? Yeah, that's the, the SSL certificate. Um, uh, yeah. That's about it for that. <laughs> anything else? Um, I do actually have the conversation between me and chat saying um, with the engineer saying um, uh, we do not recommend updating firmware using intelligent provisioning. <laughs> we would recommend you, you update the service pack for ProLiant. So um, that is HP saying, yep, we recommend you use the download. <sighs> That's about it. If you get one of these servers, I recommend taking your time. Taking your time to go through all this. Poke around. Use the help, uh, which is there. Intelligent provisioning help. Performing maintenance. It's all local. It's all on the machine. You haven't got to download anything. So performing maintenance. Um, home. 
The help is there for you using the first up rapid and performing maintenance, troubleshooting. It's all there. Use it. Get to learn the server because it has got behaviors which you won't find on your average PC in <laughs> BIOS. And what can I tell you? It's there are reasons for using um, uh, proper servers as opposed to using a PC and using it as a server. If you get the time to play around with some of this, um, I would do to see what it can bring you, to see whether it is worth buying a server like this for your needs. Because there is no doubt that when it comes to servers of this kind of uh, ability, if I was going to run um, a virtual machine host um, for a home lab, personally I would not use a server like this. The um, It's fine as it is for a couple of VMs, but <laughs> you are... Um, the processor is a little, um, you know, for the same price as this server, you can get a PC with a shed load more cores and you can make better use of it. True, there is a lot of features on here that it won't have. But if you're doing a lab at home and you're doing it for testing and learning, then... Um, I do believe that a more powerful bog standard PC would possibly be um, better value for your money than something like this. Um, but it's a case of pay your money, take your choice, do your research. This is, um, yeah, do your research and poke around. One of the interesting things that I'm just going to do while I'm here for the ILO con configuration, because we can do ILO configuration via this um, shared network port, general, subsystem. Ooh. Is it going to let me do it? Uh, Nick, LOM, port 1. Enable VLAN, we're not going to do that. Action might reset ILO, are you sure you want to continue? Yes. These changes will not take effect until it's reset. Now that's interesting. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. So, uh, okay, we're going to have to reset our love. What we've basically done here, um, Mm. We have the potential <laughs> to be able to use an access ILO potential without actually having to need that card. Potentially. I might just have landed myself in a load of trouble. <laughs> it is possible that I've just landed myself in a load of trouble. Let's see what happens. Come on, come back to me. I might just have to hook up um, a KVM get back onto the server and um, 
and do that change. Nope, I'm getting no response. Destination host unreachable. It may be rebooting, it may not. It may be enforcing the fact that I need my dedicated card or you ain't got the license. I'm going to give it a few more moments <clears throat> and I just might have got myself in some trouble. <laughs> that would have been interesting if we could have done it, but um, it doesn't look like we're able. Unreachable. Okay, I think I've stuffed that up. Um, <laughs> ILO, despite the ability to change it in the settings uh, of intelligent provisioning, um, it won't let you do it. Uh, you can understand it. It needs its dedicated... Um, oh, oh, no, unreachable. Totally unreachable. Yeah. It needs its dedicated port, and you can't pull a fast one by getting it to share the other network port. Nope. Yep, so I'm going to have to hook up a KVM and get that change undone. And uh, hoorah. <laughs> So I hope this has been um, a bit of an eye-opener for you, an introduction into remote management and some of the things that you can do on a server, a proper server with proper um, remote management and intelligent provisioning that you can't do on a PC. Um, and obviously, um, things like error-correcting memory and the ability to uh, get email warnings and things like that when things fail. Um, rather than just things just dying. So I'm going to have to um, take some time to dig myself out of this mess. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Um, obviously, questions, stick them down below, and we'll take things as they come. Until then, ciao for now.